Good morning and welcome to today's online class. Hope you all had a good week. And let's see what we're going to learn today. Last Sunday, we were introduced to the six books of the Old Testament, which is classified as wisdom literature. Children, are you interested to know something about Sister Rani Maria? Well, let's see what she has done in her life and what happened to her. Sister Rani Maria was brutally stabbed and hacked to death on 25th February 1995 at Uddai Nagar Indore. On that fatal morning, Sister Rani, a member of the Franciscan Clarist congregation, was traveling from Udainagar to Indore in a private bus which goes through the jungle roads. When the bus reached a jungle area about 25 kilometers away from Udainagar, she was stabbed again and again, in all more than 40 times, and she died on the spot. When all this happened, not a single person came to her rescue. But on the contrary, most of the passengers ran away. Sister's body soaked in a pool of blood was found lying on the side of the road. Sister had been in Udainagar for the past two and a half years engaged in the animation and organization of the poor tribals in the villages around. She formed several samitis like Sena Dal, Mahila Mandal, etc. for men and women, through which she was able to start many rural development programs, better farm production, loans and subsidies for seeds, fertilizers and irrigation projects for the farmers. She created an awareness among the villagers of Panchayat Raj and animated them to involve themselves in the administration of the village. All these things led the landowners, moneylenders and political leaders to be angry with her, hostile to any efforts made for the upliftment of the tribals. Her funeral procession from Indore to Udainagar was rather a pilgrimage and a victory march, rather than a sad journey to the tomb. She could make the words of St. Paul her own and say, I have fought a good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord will award to me that day. So children, some questions for discussion. You can take your notebook and pen and write down the answers. Sister Rani was a person who was doing no wrong. She was in fact working for the upliftment of the villagers and she met with a gruesome death. Do you know of other cases like this? When good and innocent people suffer terrible evil and violence? Do you think God can and should intervene to avoid such gruesome evil? Why? Why not? What explanation can you give for this problem of evil where good persons seem to be severely punished and made to suffer? Today's lesson is on Job. Now, let's watch a video on Job's saga.
Long ago in the faraway land of Uz, there lived a man named Job. Job was a good man. He loved God. He refused to do wrong. He was honorable. And he was rich. He had thousands of sheep, camels, oxen, donkeys, and servants, and ten children. Job was the greatest man in the land, and everything in his life went smoothly. Meanwhile, Satan took notice. He complained to God about Job. He only serves you because you give him so many blessings. If you take away Job's blessing, he'll curse you right to your face. God then told Satan to do with Job as he pleased, but on one condition, he could not harm Job. Satan slunk away, devising a devilish plan to make Job turn against God. One day, as Job was simply enjoying life, a servant ran up breathless with his devastating news. All the oxen and donkeys were stolen by an invading force, and the servants were killed. I barely escaped. Right as Job was hearing this horrible news, another servant ran up, shouting out, A huge fire came and burned all the sheep and killed all the servants. Another servant was running to Job, sobbing in terror. Job, the enemy came and stole all the camels and killed the servants. The servant had hardly finished when another servant came running to Job, screaming the most horrible news of all. Your children were having a feast together, and a terrible wind destroyed the house. Your children are all dead. In an instant, Job lost everything, his wealth and his family. They were gone. The grief was painful. Job tore his clothes, shaved his head, and fell on the ground. Satan thought Job was going to be mad at God, but instead, Job worshipped God. The Lord gave me everything, and he has the right to take it away. I will still praise God, Job said. Satan then asked God if he could make Job sick. He was sure that Job would then curse God. God told Satan that he could continue with his plan, but was not allowed to kill Job. Then it happened. Job broke out with sores over his entire body. He became very ill. The pain and itching were so unbearable that he took broken pieces of pottery to scratch the sores. Job's wife was of no help at all. She came up to her husband and growled, You're still trying to do good? Just curse God and die. Job did not sin. He continued to worship God. Even Job's friends started to turn against him. They thought that Job must have sinned for God to punish him like this. They were all trying to give him advice and tell him what to do. Instead of helping Job and praying for him, they criticized him. Through all this, Job still did not sin. He continued to trust and worship God. Job started to lose heart. He did not understand why God would allow these things to happen to him. So God spoke with Job and explained to him that as God, he created Job and everything in existence. As God, no one had the right to question him or his decisions, even though it may not make sense. God was trying to show Job a valuable lesson. Job responded in the only way possible. He worshipped, and he repented. Eventually, Job's suffering stopped. Satan's plan did not work. Job still loved God. God was so pleased with Job that he healed him and gave him back everything he lost. This time, he blessed Job with more children, wealth, and possession than he could ever imagine. Job even lived until he was 140 years of age. The end of Job's life was even better than his beginning. In this story, we have learned humans are not equal to God, nor can we ask for an accounting for God's actions. Job learned what is true faith, that is, 
putting oneself completely in God's hand with trust and hope. In this story, we have learned humans are not equal to God, nor can we ask for an accounting for God's actions. Job learned what is true faith, that is putting oneself completely in God's hand with trust and hope. Love is a mystery, so is death, so is suffering. Problems of pain and injustice in many cases can and must be solved by human creativity and wisdom. Humans do make use of God-given talents of mind and heart to lessen pain and to bring about justice. To cite just two examples, Discovery of radium to cure many diseases. The UN Declaration of Human Rights, which all nations have signed to promote justice. God expects us to do all in our power to fight evil in all its forms, including self-centeredness in human beings. But we are unable to understand nor remedy all wrongs. In the final analysis of pain and suffering of innocence like Job, we just have to accept that these are issues which we will never understand and at the same time that the ways of God are mysterious, that we are his creatures whom he loves unconditionally, that we need to relate to God in a covenant of love, trust and hope in all circumstances however baffling and painful they may be. Children, recall how the tree of knowledge of good and evil put a limit on Adam and Eve, inviting them to accept their condition as creatures, to acknowledge God as the origin of all life and that he alone can determine what can bring man happiness. Yahweh had been present and listening all the time to Job's laments, arguments and challenges. It is not as if God was on one side and Job on the other side of the tug of war. But it is God with Job on one side and Satan, Job's wife and friends on the other side. God was listening to the debate anxiously hanging on to every word, cheering and encouraging Job and sort of wincing at the false arguments of the three friends. God is like a proud parent, rejoicing at the fidelity and honesty of his trusted servant Job. God certainly does not abandon us in our pain and suffering. On the contrary, he affirms and strengthens his relationships with us. He enables us to live through the struggle. He seems to say to us, I am helpless. I cannot remove the pain and confusion, but I am with you, in you and for you. So cheer up. Children, sit straight, your feet on the ground, your eyes closed, your palms on your lap. Be still and feel the Holy Spirit of wisdom descending on you, filling your minds and hearts with his gift of understanding as we listen to this beautiful hymn. Speak.
Now gently open your eyes and let's listen to the word of God. A reading from the book of Job. And the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with God must respond. Then Job answered the Lord, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once and I will not answer twice, but will proceed no further. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have now seen how Job was aware of the retribution theory which his three wise friends kept harping on. Job's friends were insisting that Job had done something wrong. They were sort of trying to uphold God's justice by resorting to false arguments. Job, however, stuck to the truth that he was innocent and blameless before God. He could not deny his own personal experiences and humbly confesses that he was in pain, confusion and doubt over God's behavior with him. But God leads him to realize that humans are totally incapable of understanding human suffering. It is a mystery that defies reason. Job expresses this inability to understand suffering by a very significant gesture. What shall I answer? I lay my hand on my mouth. How does it feel to face an issue like this over which we have to put our hands on our mouth and say, we will never know the answer. If we did not know the answer to a question in an exam, we know that at least later on we can search and find the answer. But in the case of suffering, we are sure that we will never know the answer. We will never know why a child suffers or is born defective. We will never know why a person in the prime of youth is killed in an accident on the work site. We will never know why a newly married lady loses her husband in a tragic accident. We will never know why Sister Rani was so brutally murdered despite of the good she did for her villagers. Does this fill us with fear or reassurance? Why? Children, would you like to tell God your feelings about this matter? Let's reflect for a few moments. Now, let us recite this prayer together. Dear Lord, teach me to trust in you so that when the unexpected storms of life come, I will expect peace in the midst of those storms, knowing that you are near. You hear my cries and you are with me and for me. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this famous drawing, we can see three monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. This was made famous by the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. Faced with the mystery of suffering, we can replace the word evil by the word suffering. And let's see what message we get from this three monkeys. 
when we refer to suffering. See no evil. We can replace the word evil and say close not your eyes to the suffering. Hear no evil. We can say close not your ears to the voice of the suffering. Speak no evil. We can say, but ask not why people suffer. So children, for your activity, you will draw and write the following. Close not your eyes to the suffering. Second, close not your ears to the voice of the suffering. Third, but ask not why people suffer. In this lesson, we have learned that even in our suffering, we must not despair but remain hopeful because God is with us. He never abandons us or leaves us alone. God's presence in our life is the silver lining in the dark clouds. So, bye for now. Take care. See you next week. Till then, God bless.